thank you so much for the chance to be here today. I'm a family doctor. I've spent the last 12 years in the city of Camden. It's one of the poorest cities in the country. First, second, or third poorest city. Uh, first, second, or third most dangerous city. Uh, three of our last six mayors have been indicted and convicted of corruption. And uh, we, we face enormous uh, challenges in the city. Uh, for most of that time, I was a frontline provider. Uh, I speak Spanish, and this was my office in a Spanish-speaking part of town. Three exam rooms, running from room to room to room, seeing kids, adults, delivering babies, doing home visits, really trying to um, deliver old-style care. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is, I think, the challenge really for the next 100 years as the baby boomers age and our society continues to spend more and more on health care, how we both deliver high-touch care as well as high-tech care, how we um, right-size our delivery system. I wanna, I'm currently now the full-time executive director of a nonprofit in the city of Camden called the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers. I'm not in my office anymore. That office is empty now because the payment rates in New Jersey for Medicaid are some of the lowest in the country and kept falling during my time. I was paid $19 to $35 by the time I went out of business in this office. And you have to run pretty fast from room to room to room to make it work. And I think it's a harbinger of what's to come in healthcare, that, uh, that we have a marketplace of healthcare in which we pay too much for a certain set of services and not enough for another set of services, and that it's eroding our primary care base. And what happened to me is going to happen all over the country as students vote with their feet and choose not to go into primary care. I want to tell you a brief story of a, an outreach team that I run that goes out and meets the highest cost, most complex patients in Camden. And our team got a referral from a very good doctor, went out to see the patient, and it was a patient in his 70s who had sugars in the 500s and was going to the hospital and emergency room over and over and over. And he had a great doc, and his doc said, I, I don't know what's going on. Can you go figure this patient out? So my team, a nurse practitioner, community health worker, and social worker, went out and met with the patient. And the first thing they wanted to do is watch him use his insulin. So he set the bottle of insulin down. He put a syringe into the bottle and drew up 50 cc's of air and went to inject it into his arm. And my team was horrified. And they slowly began to realize that he was sight impaired and that he couldn't see the syringe and had actually been doing this for many years. He went to the refrigerator and he pulled out two bags of insulin that had partly full bottles. And he said, I use my insulin every day, but I can't seem to empty the bottles. And the pharmacies just kept bringing his medicine. And I really think this is a metaphor for what's going on in a healthcare system. Any of you could have fixed this if you had walked into his house and, and watched him use his insulin. Any of the many nurses in the triage of the emergency rooms, his primary care docs, the front desk receptionist could have fixed this. Um, and it's really a metaphor for what's going on in healthcare, which is, once again, we pay too much for a certain set of services. If you cut, scan, zap, or ho hospitalize someone, you get paid far more for that hour of time than if you talk to someone. That in healthcare, it doesn't pay to talk. If you wonder why your doctor is running for the door handle after 10 minutes, it's because they're not paid to stay in the room. They're paid to run from room to room to room as fast as they can. That the entire delivery system makes far more money from cutting, scanning, zapping, or hospitalizing you. And that's going to be an enormous challenge as we go forward. The bulk of the long-term federal debt, the dotted line here is 2010 through 2080. The dark blue is Social Security. The top part, Medicare, Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, is the, is the portion of the federal debt attributable to health care. The bulk of the federal debt going forward, the debt ceiling, all the fight going on at the federal level, is my industry. It's health care. And it goes up by about 4 to 10 percent every year, inexorably. It's currently 18 percent of the economy, or one in every five dollars. And it will go to 25 percent of the economy, one in every four dollars. And there's almost no way to change that. We have a freight train headed down the tracks with 85 million baby boomers on it and no idea how to deliver efficient, cost-effective, high-quality service. We spend twice as much as every industrialized country, and we cover uh, not all of our citizens, and by many objective measures, uh, deliver very poor, poor quality service. Uh, this is a famous study called the Dartmouth Atlas, which looks at Medicare, which is people over 65, in every state and says, if it's a scientific discipline, it should be the same from state to state. And it turns out to be highly variable what we spend. So this is doctor and hospital spending in all 50 states. My state, New Jersey, is the most expensive state in the most expensive delivery system in the world, $39,000 per Medicare recipient in the last two years of life. Philadelphia turns out to be a hot spot for cost. New York turns out to be a hot spot for cost. And it turns out if you, if you pull the lid off of this, one of the predictors of this turns out to be the supply of services. 
If you want to know how many people in Philadelphia right now are admitted to the hospital, don't count up the number of sick people, count up the number of hospital beds. If you want to know how many people visited a cardiologist last year in Philadelphia, don't find out how many heart failure patients there are, just ask how many cardiologists are there. That it's a very unique industry and that it can drive its own demand. That rarely do not uh, follow the directions of the doctor who says, we're going to admit your mom today uh, up into the hospital. Um, to, to get detailed about this, this is a famous study that was done on people who have a bad knee. These are 50-year-olds with torn cartilage. And this is a bread and butter procedure, makes lots and lots of money. And they did what's called a randomized controlled trial. They did a sham arthroscopy. So they put the scope in and just took it back out. And they didn't do the normal trim job. And you woke up with a Band-Aid on your knee and you didn't know which group you were in. It turns out that both groups got better at the exact same rate. <laughs> that this procedure makes no difference. If you're an athlete and you have an acute tear, it's a miracle, it's an incredible technology. But we misapply this technology. We do 650,000 arthroscopies. The reason you get better is someone takes you out of work for 12 weeks, tells you you don't have to cook or clean, that you go to physical therapy three times a week, and you'd all be healthier if I did that for you. <laughs> Over and over and over in healthcare, we misapply technology. Uh, we take a good technology and begin to misapply it. So what happens is everyone wants to do this because you make a lot of money doing it. So they run out of sick people. So then you put lots of billboards up and say, our hospital's better than your hospital, or our doctors are smarter than your doctors. And it still doesn't work. There still aren't enough sick people because everyone's built capacity to do this. So then you work down the continuum to less sick and less sick and less sick people to the point you're doing stuff that doesn't matter. And we're doing a whole lot of stuff that doesn't matter to the point that we have inflated a bubble in our country of unnecessary hospital and specialty care. And it's the mother of all bubbles. It's a capacity bubble much larger than the banking bubble and the housing bubble. This is 18% of our economy. The finance industry was 7%. Housing industry was 11%. Another famous study showing that angioplasty, putting a stent in someone's heart, doesn't work. They randomized people to talking to aggressive medication management or putting a stent in, and they got better at the exact same rate. So if you have a heart attack, a stent is a miracle. But we ran out of heart attack victims, so then we started putting stents in anyone and everyone. So that if you have a 90% blockage, an 80% blockage, a 70%, a 60%, on and on, we misapply technology over and over. I want to bring this down to um, Camden now and describe how this plays out in Camden. Uh, I managed to get raw claims data, billing data, for every Camden resident now from 2002 up to 2011. This is very hard to get. This is business intelligence of the hospitals. And quickly learned, we had no idea what we were doing at the time. Uh, it still is in Microsoft Access with open source encryption software. Uh, we use, you know, it cost about $1,000, $2,000, the whole setup for this analysis. We quickly learned that half the population uses an ER hospital in one year, that someone went 324 times to the hospital in a five-year period, someone went 113 times in one year. In Trenton, someone went 450 times in one year. The total revenue or payment to the hospitals in Camden, nine square mile city, three hospitals for just emergency room and hospital care is $460 million over a five year period, plus 200 million in charity care. $650 million to buy disorganized, what I would argue is poor quality care, unnecessary care in many instances. The most expensive patient had 3.5 million in receipts. This is almost all your money. This is, because it's such a poor city, this is almost all publicly funded. 30% of the costs go to 1% of the patients, 80% of the costs to 13% of the patients, and 90% to 20% of the patients. A small sliver of the patients are driving much of the cost. The number one reason to go to an emergency room at Camden is head colds. 12,000 visits for head colds over five years. Number two is ear infection. Number three is viral infection. Number four, sore throat, asthma, stomach virus. All primary care problems. Most of these patients have insurance. And the emergency rooms are making 150, 300, 500, 800, 1,000 dollars for these visits. So offices like mine in Camden are closing up and they get boarded up. They sit empty, and the emergency rooms have tripled in size, and the hospitals have grown. And that is a metaphor for what's going on all over the country, that hospitals are getting larger, that the healthcare industry's specialty and hospital side and acute care side is getting bigger and bigger, because we're paying too much to cut, scan, zap, and hospitalized, and not enough to talk to people. These are cost hotspots. This is a map of the city of Camden mapping out all three hospitals' data to find out 
where do the expensive people live and do they live close to one another? This is five years of data and the red areas on the city map over here, which are a very small area, are 6% of the city blocks, 10% of the land mass, 18% uh, of the patients, 27% of the visits, and 37% of the receipts. The two most expensive buildings, one's at the base of the Ben Franklin Bridge, 600 patients cost 12 million in receipts just for hospital care over a five-year period, and the Abigail uh, House had 300 patients with 15 million in payments to the hospitals over five years. This is big business, there's a lot of money moving around here. And unfortunately, if there was an outbreak of health and well-being, if the hospitals in America and Philadelphia lost 5% of bed days right now, they would all close, they would go under. That the business model of a hospital and a specialty office is the same as the airline industry and the hotel industry. That it's occupancy rates and turnover. And that's their, their, their profit model. You know, this is a uh, model in which uh, it's a volume-based delivery system. And the more clicks through the turnstile that all of you make and your relatives make, the more money you make. Um, you know, essentially good doctors and good hospitals go to work every day, but ultimately de deliver a fragmented, disorganized product. And many of you won't know this until you're lying in a bed yourself or your relatives lying in a bed, and you start to realize that you know more about the medical case than any of the doctors walking in the room because none of them are talking to one another. These are both beautiful buildings. This is not a problem of you know, crime-ridden, ugly buildings. These have great management. This is a story of disorganized healthcare. I've spent about a year in the top building uh, doing community organizing, asking the residents, do you feel like you got $12 million worth of healthcare in the last five years? And the answer is no, they don't feel that way at all. <laughs> They've seen this data and they're appalled. And we videotaped their stories and their stories are terrible. I'm deeply, deeply, profoundly embarrassed by bad, how bad their healthcare is. So we've done a lot of community organizing and we've joined with a church group called Camden Churches Organized for People that's part of a national faith-based community organizing group. And we're doing community organizing in health because we've got to pull aside the curtain and talk about what's really going on. If we want patients to be engaged, they need to know where the money is and where the power is. We pulled together residents from the building and across the city and also from across the country uh, and came together and I sent them out to all my stakeholders and I said, go out and ask them, how do they make money and what are they worried about in the future? And we came back and mapped all that out. So that's mapping all the money in healthcare out up here and then mapping out the point of view of each stakeholder. Then in the evening, we came together in a church. And my feeling at this point is this is a moral, ethical, and political problem. It's not a technical problem, fixing healthcare. So we came together in a church that's right next to Northgate, because it turns out that a lot of the residents that live in this building go to this church. So it was very convenient. And that's my hospital CEO up on the left. That's a state official, the head of the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce. And the woman in pink lives in Northgate and has sarcoidosis and has terrible stories about how hard it's been to access healthcare. That healthcare is based on the average model. If, the, if you're the average patient, it's, you can sort of get healthcare services. But as you get sicker and sicker, and you become an outlier in the delivery system, that the whole system begins to fall apart. That if you're blind, deaf, disabled, if you uh, have chronic illnesses, if you're older, if you don't speak English, the delivery system begins to fall apart because it's a volume-based system. And you make a lot more profit margin if you run to room to room to room seeing head colds than if you spend time taking care of sick people. Uh, we made a promise that night. We literally hung a covenant on the wall. And we promised one another that we're going to stop pointing fingers, that doctors were going to stop calling patients non-compliant, that patients were going to stop voting with their feet and not going to the doctor and not taking their medicines, that hospital administrators were going to own the fact that this is a volume-based model and needs to change, and that the insurance companies were going to get in the game here and help us fix this. And we made two concrete promises. One was to pass legislation in New Jersey, which created a shared savings model. So if we all worked together in the city of Camden and bent the cost curve, that we could capture a portion of the savings. And the second promise was to listen to Northgate residents. And what they told us, and this is the outcome, is they wanted a clinic right in their building, that moving sick people around in the delivery system is a waste of money. We need to bring health care to patients. So uh, about 12 weeks ago, this is a ribbon cutting with our state senator and our mayor and all our political officials, and that's Pilar cutting a ribbon in the first floor of Northgate for a very small uh, primary care office. And it's been open for about 12 weeks. It's staffed about two to three days a week. And this is a great experiment. My feeling is that if I can't bend the cost curve and improve care for one building, I'll never do it at the city level. And because we have all the claims data, we can track the outcomes of this project over over time. We put a yoga class in there, a diabetic support group. I'm going to throw everything in the kitchen sink at one building until I figure this out. 
We've done the same thing around one patient, and then two patients, and then five patients, and then 10, which is go out and meet the most expensive people in the city and build healthcare around the most extreme patients. Because after you've cared for a homeless schizophrenic with a, a brain tumor and a diabetic foot ulcer, everyone else looks easy. Um, <laughs> And the other thing we've done is a deep dive into specific primary care offices, because I can't, if I can't fix one office and improve primary care, then I can't do this at the city level. This is the outcome for the legislation. Uh, we spent about two years, and I never thought I would be going from running from room to room in a little primary care office to essentially going out of business, to running around the state trying to figure out what's a business model in healthcare for doing the right thing. And this legislation was signed by a Republican governor, passed with bipartisan support. So if you want to know what a Republican will support in health care, it's better care at lower cost with no upfront money. There's no upfront funding with this. But if we bend the cost curve in Camden and improve quality, then we can capture a portion of the savings back through a nonprofit shared intermediary. Our savings are very, our strategies are very concrete. We're going to put nurse practitioner clinics in five high cost buildings have at least five outreach teams seeing the high cost complex patients. We'll um, have 15 nurses embedded in 15 primary care offices to catch sick people, pay attention to them, and what's called same day access or same day appointments. And, and that's it. So the, the bet is on in Camden as to whether we can bend the cost curve. And we signed our first contract with United Healthcare, uh, that is the, a large Medicaid payer in New Jersey uh, as of September 1st. So I'll let you know in a year and four months if we pull it off. Thank you very much. <laughs>